America has incurred God's judgment, and his retribution will be swift. In the same way that God said to Judah, for three sins, I will send fire on Judah. So he says to our once great nation. But what are America's three sins, and can we escape the coming judgment? I came across this scripture in the book of Amos, and it is a call to repentance to ancient Judah. Amos was a prophet who prophesied around 750 BC. This would have been while Israel still had two kingdoms. Amos said these words to the southern kingdom of Judah. This is what the Lord says, for three sins of Judah, even for four, I will not relent because they have rejected the law of the Lord and have not kept his decrees because they have been led astray by false gods, the gods their ancestors followed. I will send fire on Judah and will consume the fortresses of Jerusalem. Okay, so if America has these predisposed sins that we are committing, these are, I think, three abominations that our country is currently committing. When we look at ancient cultures and we think about abortion and, and what that is today, what does it most readily compare itself to? What, what, what does it look like? What does it remind you of? Well, I, th I think when you look at ancient cultures and what they did, they performed child sacrifice. Wikipedia defines child sacrifice as the ritualistic killing of children in order to please or appease a deity, supernatural be beings, or sacred social order, tribal group, in order to achieve a desired result. As such, it is a form of human sacrifice. Okay, we all know this, right? Child sacrifice is thought to be an extreme extension of the idea that the more important the object of sacrifice, the more devout the person rendering it. The practice of child sacrifice in Europe and the Near East appears to have ended as part of the religious transformation of late antiquity. The one thing it seems like we can't credit today for any good in the world is Christianity. If you look back to the ancient Roman world, Christians were the ones who were rescuing the, the exposed babies because back then it was more common to do what was called to basically throw your baby away if you didn't want it and uh, leave it to the elements, leave him or her to the elements. And so that's what they would do. The Christians would go rescue these discarded children, and they'd raise them. And they were actually responsible for some of the first orphanages that we saw in Western culture. So Christianity has a long history of rescuing and standing up against some of these social evils. Take a look at these statistics. Now, this is statistics for child termination in the... This is the amount of abortions that we've had in this country. If you look at that graph there, it seems to have gone down a little bit, but these are, are two of the, the main organizations that track this, the CDC and then the, the Guttmacher. I don't even know how to say that, but this is a lot of unborn children that are not brought into the world because it's legal in our country to, to terminate them. You can see there that, I mean, during the 80s, it was, you know, at over a million, a million and a half, approaching two million children a year in America. These aren't global statistics. This is in America. Just think about this for a moment. Think about, th think about these numbers and think about something else we often demonize in our culture, the Holocaust, Hitler, the Nazis. And what they did, they killed 6 million Jews. I think they killed over a million gypsies in the Holocaust. And if you look at the numbers, you just extrapolate that backwards since we've been keeping abortion statistics in this country. You're talking about 60 million plus, maybe more, maybe significantly more. But let's just say 60 million infants slaughtered. What is the difference between child sacrifice, ancient child sacrifice, and modern child termination. I mean, we can say that that's not a baby, but that doesn't change the fact he or she in the womb has human DNA. It doesn't change that. I, I think most people know deep down in their heart, I mean, you, you can 
push the truth down and you can suppress it as much as you want. But when you talk to somebody who has either paid for one of these procedures or had it done themselves and they talk about that moment right after they've done it, the horror that they have, I think people realize what they're doing. It's just sad to see in a culture, in a once great nation that has prided itself on being Christian, how can we as a nation say that we have murdered 60 million people, that is 10 times the Holocaust. We, we put Nazi Germany to shame for our slaughter of innocence. And, and we do it for a plethora of different reasons, right? I mean, get, getting back to this, this definition of child sacrifice and how, you know, it, we think of child sacrifice just as something that's done to a deity, but certainly we are capable of making our own deities today. What maybe do we worship today? You know, maybe we worship unadulterated freedom, which isn't true biblical freedom. True biblical freedom is the knowledge of Christ and, and knowing the one true God. That's true freedom. It is, it is for freedom, as Paul says in his letter to the Galatians, that Christ has set us free. But we worship a perversion, a perverted version of freedom that says we can do whatever we want, whenever we want, to whomever we want, so long as I am happy. I think that's another thing that we worship is happiness. And so, you know, we, we see here again, getting back to this this definition here, sacred, it is the, the killing of children for a sacred social order. Do we have a social order in American, modern American society today that is that is distinctly different from what the social order was when America was founded? Absolutely we do. Because when America was founded, the idea was that we were a Christian nation, but it was assumed in the culture. We weren't a Buddhist nation. We weren't a, an Islamic nation. We were a Christian nation. And the principles that we have come from the Bible. The laws that we have come from the Bible. And so we were a Christian nation, but today it's, it's different. We worship our understanding of freedom is the freedom to live out whatever perversion we want to live out. It's the freedom to commit murder by just changing the definition of what a life is. And we do it for lots of different reasons, but I think it clearly fits within what we would call ancient child sacrifice. It, it, this is a, uh, we're doing this for multiple, we're doing it for financial gain to achieve a desired result, like it says here. That, that, that's why we have committed this incredible atrocity. And, and I ask you as a sane human being, you have to see the truth in what I'm saying. 60 million lives. You, you know, one thing that's demonized in our culture today, the, the Spanish Inquisition, and, and these are just statistics that I've heard. I can't pull anything up official for you, but it's really demonized in our culture as this terrible stain on human history. And, and it may have been. But do you know that only like Three to 5,000 people were ultimately killed in the Spanish Inquisition. This, this terrible thing. I, it was horrible, right? Let's just say it was horrible. 60 million people, human beings, have been legally slaughtered in America. You know, we put down slavery in this country, which was the cruel, harsh form of American slavery that we saw, which really wasn't just America, but it was the West. It was taking place in other European cultures. We inherited it from them. But we put that down in our culture, and we don't realize the egregious stench that we are. And I promise you, God is, he is watching. He sees it. This is one of our sins. Let's call it strike one. And I promise you, God is, he is watching. He sees our hypocrisy. And I am pleading with people in our communities to start standing up against this evil, lest God take out his judgment on us as a nation. The second thing that I think we're guilty of is having our own modern day sex cult. One of the other things that you see in ancient paganism are these things called, we call them today, I guess, a sex cult. Well, here's our definition. A cult in which unrestrained sexual activity is central to worship, ceremonies, etc. This is an ancient sex cult. Sometimes they were re referred to as fertility cults, a part of the Americas. You know, the, the people that supposedly we came over here and stole this land from as Europeans. I'm not justifying everything that we've ever done 
as a people. All I'm saying is that the world before Jesus came was immersed in these kinds of things. And here we see in Western culture, this stuff reasserting itself. Do we have a modern day sex cult that does these same things? Unrestrained sexual activity that is central to worship, ceremonies, etc. I think it's rather obvious that we have a modern day sex cult running rampant and and even running the show today in our department stores. It, it, it's a an out of control sex cult that is pushing its perversions on our children. It's doing it to promote happiness as we've redefined it. You know, happiness again biblically. It's the joy of the Lord. It's a peace that surpasses all understanding. It's totally different than just a fleeting feeling and sexual pleasure. Do you think that modern America worships pleasure? I think we worship sexual pleasure. But certainly we have a modern day sex cult that worships outward image, appearance, totally different than what the Bible teaches us. It doesn't say you can't dress nice, but it says that the most important thing is what's on the inside in the heart. And so our modern sex cult is teaching our children the opposite. And, and we wonder why there's so much depression. We wonder why people seem to ultimately be happy. One of the things that we've seen a lot lately, the last couple of years, is statistics on transgenderism. And people who, you know, they think that they're going to find happiness and, and they, they don't find happiness. They think that all they need is a different, they think all they need to do is hate their own body and mutilate their own flesh. These are things that took place with cult worship, with ancient pagan sacrifices, the mutilation of the body, the human body, to hate yourself and your offspring. It is demonic. And when I think about the state of our country today, and, and as somebody who has Two boys. I wonder sometimes what kind of culture are those boys going to inherit? Do they live in a place where it's actually even safe to marry? Take a look at this, because I, I felt like this explains a lot. This is the book of Hebrews in the Bible, written possibly or probably by the Apostle Paul. And, and, and here we read about sexual purity. We, this explains kind of the, I guess, the biblical Christian understanding of sexual purity. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. For by doing so, people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. What are we talking about here? What, what is the context of, of what the Apostle Paul is bringing up? In his letter to the Hebrews here, What's, what Bible story is he talking about here? It seems highly likely that in the back of his mind, it's the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. When angels went and visited Abraham as strangers, one of those was the angel of the Lord, possibly the pre-incarnate Christ. Abraham, of course, pleads for Sodom. But what does the city of Sodom do? Instead of showing the angels hospitality, they try to take the angels sexually by force. I'm trying to watch my language for YouTube. Fill in, you, you know what the word is. You know what they tried to do to them. This was Sodom and Gomorrah that's in the backdrop here. When Paul continues, continue in verse 3, to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. And then in verse 4, marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure for God will judge the adulterer adulterer, and all of the sexually immoral. So, so what am I getting at here? Like, what, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that our country has its own sex cult. And this sex cult is literally running the cultural show today. And the Christians do nothing. You know, and I hate to call you out like this, but, but let's be real. Let's be real. Until the last couple years... I haven't seen Christians do much of anything. In fact, we've looked at Christians who did something, and we've really said that these people aren't being nice. And I'm not like them. I'm not like one of those Christians who, you know, just who's hypersensitive about the sin of homosexuality. I'm not one of those kind of Christians. We've heard that narrative, right? I mean, I, I'm not just... <laughs> I'm not just making this up, right? You know what I'm talking about because I've been immersed in the evangelical Christian community for the last nearly 30 years and I've seen it and I've preached sermons and, and I realized like, you know, that was one of the things that, that I didn't often talk about as a preacher 10 years ago 
when it would have been a lot easier to talk about it. And people who do talk about it, you know, they're just, they're just homophobic. Well, you know, let's, let's look again at, at, at this letter to the Hebrews and the scripture. Again, what biblical backstory does Paul have in mind when he's saying that God will judge the sexually immoral? What biblical backstory do you think he could possibly have in mind? Was it the Exodus where they plunged themselves into sexual immorality? You know, when they made the altar of the golden calf and all that stuff. Well, it could be. But here's the thing is he's talking about angels visiting a community. So, so when he's saying God will judge the sexually immoral, and this absolutely, this absolutely is a warning, a flashing red siren. You know the sirens that go off at noon? I don't know if you have those in your community. You know, like they go off at noon, the sirens, like on Saturdays around here. Ever since I was a kid, it's like a warning siren. It's just a test. Sometimes they go off when there's a tornado. It's telling people that there's danger. This is a warning siren. This country is no longer a Christian country. It was a Christian country. This country is following in the footsteps, going back to Amos that we started off with, of the paganism that its ancestors practiced. And I just showed you two ways that we're doing it. In our country, think about this. If, if you're a, a church leader, I want you to just speculate in your mind right now. How many people in your church may have had an abortion? Maybe you've performed one. Maybe you're a doctor who's performed one. Think about it. Think about the fact that this country is performing openly and legally pagan child sacrifice. This country has its own sex cult that is teaching our children sexual perversions from a young age through drag queen story hour. And, you know, all we're, we're trying to really teach them this from the time they're young as though they can't figure out perversion for themselves. We need perverts to teach our children how to be more perverted and from a younger age. Yet we've taken the 10 commandments out of our school systems in the name of what I think our third egregious sin is in this country, and that's secularism and the modern-day high priesthood that we have. You don't think this is true? Well, first, I, I want to encourage you that the idea of secularism is actually a myth because you really can't be fully secular. Uh, I, I read a good book on this years ago about the human heart and how the human heart is religious, deeply religious. It was written actually by a sociologist, and uh, it's, it's about how our nature as people is to worship things. You can't take the worship out of human nature, and, and that's why it's wrong to worship false gods. Well, when we promote modern secularism, this isn't, again, the, the understanding of the founders of our country. That's why they saw that, w that our freedom— is actually very religious. It's written about in the Declaration of Independence. You all know this. I'm, you know, just, I'm just reciting what you already know. But in the Declaration of Independence, it says that we've been endowed with these freedoms from our Creator, from God. Uh, in the Constitution, it says, in the year of our Lord. In other words, we're a Christian people, and they were all Christians, by the way, who were signed the Declaration of Independence. And, you know, the idea that they were creating a secular government to give us freedom from religion is ridiculous. It's rewriting history. We, we are creating through our modern understanding, you know, our, our 20th and 21st century understanding of secularism. We are promoting and paving the way for uh, basically a neo-paganism. And that's what we're becoming. So if you wonder if is secularism boy, is it, is it really neutral? Well, look at our culture today. Look at what the secularists 
let's use air quotes there, secularists. Let's look at what they teach us and look, let's look at the society that they have created. Christianity promotes a culture of life. But what do we see through some of the secular uh, historical governments? Communism, communist Russia. What did we see in the gulags? What did we see in all of the uh, purgings that Stalin had and the atheism that he promoted? What did we see through Hitler? What, what did we see? Hitler certainly wasn't a Christian. I mean, if anything, he was a mystic. He was seeing fortune tellers and things like that. And his uh, generals were trying to um, recreate the pagan religion of their ancestors. Look it up. <laughs> so this idea of, uh, of paganism, th this, uh, this idea of secularism being neutral is ridiculous. It's ridiculous historically. It's ridiculous in our current s situation, societally. Again, look at what we're doing. There is a new religion in our country. It's a religion of secularism. But it's just that, a new religion. Religions have a narrative. Religions have a, uh, they have high priests. Do we not have high priests today? People who go before the gods and who are seeking our favor. Uh, they're sacrificing to the gods of pleasure and financial gain and happiness and selfishness. These are the gods of our country today. And our high priests are the ones who are promoting this in culture. Our high priests are the ones who are in our governments. In some cases, they're in our churches. And they're going before supernatural entities seeking their favor and creating what we currently see in our nation. I don't think there's any other rational human explanation for it. If you look at the if you look at the narrative, the modern narrative of where we came from because another important thing in uh, in a religion is a narrative of where it's an origin story. Do we have an origin story today? Absolutely we do. It's that we evolved from lower life forms and that we're animals. If you think about the implications of this, of us being animals, it means that we can behave like the animals. Again, you don't look too far out there to see that this is exactly what's taking place. How far we've strayed from our roots. Um, this is the narrative today. Evolution is the new, it's the new pagan narrative. And if you think about what pa the pagan narratives that came before it promoted, they promoted uh, the idea of a worship of the creation. They made people where the Bible teaches us that we're made in the image of God above the creation. We have a responsibility given to us by God to demonstrate his character in the world. That includes his character with our sexuality. It includes his character with our relationships. It includes his character with our giving to our churches and to his kingdom and all of this different stuff. If you look at what the pagan religions that came before us taught, they taught us to worship the creation. Well, what does our new narrative teach us? It teaches us to worship the creation. That's exactly what we see happening today. We see people who are immersed in it, worshiping the creation rather than the creator. And so for all these reasons that I've just mentioned, and I could go on, what we've seen reemerge culturally in this country, it isn't secularism. It isn't just these cultural practices, but it is demonic paganism. And what do we do? What do we do with this? These, this is, it's, it's really like the three strikes and you're out. I mean, in all seriousness, this is not going unnoticed by the Lord. He sees this. He sees it happening. He's, he's, he knows every life that has fallen and been terminated unjustly. If our laws are unjust and they're not honoring God, 
God is going to discipline us accordingly. If we're practicing openly murder and immorality and perversion, and we're teaching others to do the same, including little children, remember what Jesus said to those who lead little children astray. Remember, what do you think is going to happen to this nation? And and I'm of the mindset, we don't know when Jesus is going to return. He certainly will. I don't know if it'll be in our lifetime. I know there's a lot of people out there today saying, hey, it's, it's the end of days. But do you know every Christian culture that has come before us has said that? Every single one of them. It might just be the end of America, and it ain't going to be pretty. It might not just be a civil war, but it might be. It, it probably will be foreign invaders God taking our land away from us, just like he did Israel. If God was so gracious with Israel, if he was so, uh, excuse me, harsh on them for their blatant sin, how much harsher will he be for the Gentile nations that he's grafted in, including the righteous United States of America? That's what we've always been as a righteous nation. And we've prided ourselves on that. But a time of judgment is certainly coming because Jesus is seated at the right hand of God and he's not running a democracy. He's running the world. And when he speaks, flames of fire come out of his mouth. He will cut down his enemies Do not be found on the wrong side of the Lord. I fear for this nation. I fear for our children. And I just really want to encourage you, if you are a leader in this country, ask yourself what you can do for God's kingdom here. Because don't think he will hold you innocent. I had to really do a gut check on this myself some time ago. What am I really doing? What am I really doing to change this culture for Jesus? I can't just say because I have a lot of people attending my church, and I personally don't, but maybe you do. You can't say that because you have a lot of people attending your church, you're impacting culture for Jesus. You may be, but don't think you get a free pass from what is going on in your own community. Do something about it. And don't hide. Don't hide behind your morality. Don't hide behind some ideology that says you're not supposed to do anything uh, uh, controversial. What do you see in the early church? You see people doing a lot of controversial things. They pushed into their communities. They unashamedly preached the gospel. And one of the things they talked about was God's judgment. It was something that they preached to a pagan culture, even if they were sneered at, like Paul was in Acts chapter 17. He says that you, everyone, the whole human race, will be judged by the one man that God has appointed, Jesus Christ. And and the reason we even, we inherited a Christian culture is because of the sacrifices that our ancestors and those, the generations that came before us made to give us the freedoms that we have. Friends, Christians, brothers and sisters, church leaders, we are squandering this today. And I really fear for us. I know if you have kids or grandkids in this community that I live in in here in Northeastern Ohio, or if you have have them nationally, you really need to do a gut check. And you really need to realize that, that, It's better to sacrifice your own life in this world and to serve Jesus in this world, even if it costs you your life, even if you get canceled. It's better to do that than to go into God's judgment saying that you didn't do anything for him when you could have, saying that you didn't do anything for the innocents, for the kids that are being uh, molested today, for the kids that are being murdered today that are having their, uh, their minds changed from the agenda of cultural 
perverts. You want to you want to sacrifice and you want to do what you can today to to make that happen. And and if you want to know to what extreme, you know, Pastor AJ, you're telling me to be extreme. I'm only I'm only telling you to follow the example of the people that we see in the Bible. That's all I'm telling you to do. Look at Paul. Look at the communities he went into. Look how they were turned upside down. Look at the division that the gospel caused. Look at how he died, and every one of Jesus' disciples died, was martyred except for John. Every single one. They tried to martyr John, but they were unsuccessful, at least according to tradition. Look at the the earliest Christian fathers that we have outside of them. They were all the same. Polycarp, Justin Martyr, uh, Ignatius. Some fascinating quotes. You know, you, you read Ignatius talking about his martyrdom, how he believes he's going to go be torn apart by wild animals, and he says, Lord, I will entice them to come to me. I mean, that's, that's taking crazy to a whole other level. Like, so am, am I preaching extremism? No, I'm just preaching pastors, church leaders, Christians. Just, just be biblical. Just follow, follow the example. Jesus himself Jesus himself. Why did they all die? Because they because Jesus died the same way they did. So uh, I want to wrap it all up just by encouraging you to pray with me for our country. This has just been so much on my heart. Uh, I really am very concerned for the future of this country. I, I really think that uh, whether or not Jesus comes in this generation, I tend to not think he's going to. I tend to think he's, you know, he may still be a ways off. He might come in a hundred years. He might come in a thousand years. I tend to, you know, <laughs> have the longer view. But um, I think America, I think our fate is sealed if we don't have repentance, if we don't start to honor God. And so I just wanted to encourage you. Um, I know this is a little bit of a somber, uh, a little bit of a somber message today, but I, I really just wanted to encourage you to pray for this country, pray for your community, and ask what you can. Ask yourself Don't ask your wife. Don't ask your friends. Ask Jesus what you can do, because he's got a different standard than we have. Ask Jesus what you can do, and do a gut check and say, what can I do? When I look at these other examples of what Christians who came before me sacrificed, what can I do to save my nation, this nation that I love so much, that I want to pass down to my kids a community where it's safe to not only preach the gospel, but to live it out, to be a Christian. A community where it's safe, it's going to be safe for your kids to, to be in heterosexual marriages and, and raise children. What can you give? Uh, what can you give? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you right now, God, and a bit of a somber message today, but certainly one that's on my heart. Uh, I wanted to give to the listening audience out there. Lord God, we, um, we want to pray for the United States of America. Uh, we have the 4th of July coming up here uh, in another you know, week and a half or so. And uh, Lord um, God, we, just, we realize the gross, egregious sins that we have been guilty of, Lord. And it's, it's just like our scripture that we began with, with Amos, and the words that you spoke through him many years ago, Lord, that you would judge Judah uh, God, your, your crown jewel in the world, you would judge for their immorality. And, uh, and you did. You did. They were led off into captivity. You gave the land rest from their immorality. You will do the same with us. And so, God, um, we thank you for whatever, whatever the future holds. But, God, we, we do pray We do pray for this country, and we do pray the best. We pray for revival, God. In Jesus' name, God, we come before you just like Abraham interceded for Sodom. We intercede for this nation, and we say, God, please save it. Please bring us back to our Christian roots. Please get the Ten Commandments in all of our uh, what have become secular schools God, make us a Christian nation again. And God, we pray. We pray that our kids would have a place like we've had. That we can be Christians and we can know Jesus and we can have freedom 
and we can have life. God, we pray that for them. We pray that for all those who are listening, Lord God. We pray for this nation because we love it. We even pray for our enemies, Lord, those who are part of uh, these entities, these institutions, Lord. Our modern-day sex cult. God, we pray for the, the, the high priests who are performing these child sacrifices. We call them doctors today, Lord, but, but really they're, they're modern high priests in our, our new secular religion. We pray for them, that you would, God, that you would stop them, stop them from what they're doing because it's hurting people, and stop them from what they're doing, Lord, because they will incur judgment, and we don't want them to incur judgment for what they're going to do, Lord. We pray for them, Lord. Please save them. Please forgive them. Please draw them to repentance, Lord, and do all of this so that we as a people might maintain our land and our blessing, God, in your world. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll see you next time, friends. Hey guys, Pastor AJ here, and thanks for visiting my channel. If you don't mind, I'm going to take just a sec to tell you about Gospel Ministries and our mission to help others experience, demonstrate, and share God's great gospel. If you want, you can pick up some of our merch in our YouTube store to help you communicate that same gospel message. And I'd love it if you would consider subscribing to this channel so that we can challenge your Christian walk through solid biblical teaching as it applies to culture and other issues. In addition to that, you can go to PastorAJ.com where you can consider partnering with this ministry and and sign up for my weekly email newsletter. Don't forget, I'm on all other social media platforms at Pastor AJ Platt. One other item that might interest you has to do with a topic that I've studied pretty extensively. It's my book, End Times Mission, that will give you a solid education on the different views of eschatology and, more importantly, your role in Jesus' kingdom while we wait for his return. This book covers the historical origins of popular end times teachings as it guides the reader to Christ's current reign in a post-millennial worldview. Oh, and one last thing. I want you to know that you know Jesus. So if you'd like to, leave a comment or send me a message so that I can help you do just that because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. <laughs>